Welcome back to the Green Rush Live. I am your host, Josh Kincaid. I'm with the Talking Heads, your cannabis business podcast. With me for this segment, Meg LaRue and Josh Crosney, both with MJH Life Sciences. We've got a couple of new guests for this segment. Uh, we've got Chris Hudola. Um, He's the founder and CSO of Proverde Laboratories and then Do Dr. John McKay, co-founder of Dr. John McKay Institute of Extraction Technology. Everybody, thanks for being with us at the Green Rush. Oh, good for fun. Us. Appreciate it. Um, jumping right in, um, maybe we can start with, with genetics. I know you guys are about extraction and laboratories, but it all starts with genetics. How do you guys select quality genetics? Well, I'm on, I'm on the, on the back end. So someone brings me their genetics and therefore I, I now take it. So if they brought me a, a, um, a green apple, then I'll do something with it with a granny apple. If I, for example, have a, you know, Washington crisp, then I'll do something different with that or a Macintosh. So on my side, it's not so much being involved on that part, but being able to have people test on that part, which, you know, drives it over towards Chris. Yeah, so we're we're looking at what's in the what's in the plant, what kind of expression of cannabinoids or terpenes. Uh, we aren't on the front end on the cultivation where we're actually looking at specific uh, genetics. Okay, Meg, you have any follow up questions you would like to ask? Um, I would love to just dive in a little bit on the cannabis science conference because you guys are both speaking at it. Um, so, Chris, could you share a little bit about what you'll be speaking about at the conference, and then John, same question to you. Sure. Um, starting in late 2018, uh, we started noticing in our analytical data signals, chemical signals, which were unfamiliar to us. Uh, as, as we kind of started to delve into that, we realized that these were uh, the product of synthetic processes, mostly in relation to converting CBD from hemp uh, into some of the synthetic THC molecules. And we started seeing a lot of synthetic byproducts and potentially other contaminants. Um, and so we've been Kind of delving into our chromatography or into our analytical data to try and understand what is the nature of these compounds are there toxicological concerns associated with them uh, and then we see other synthetic uh, transformations happening where people are making the thcp or the thco or the thcpo um, it's a whole alphabet soup of synthetics um, and what we do is we try and uh, update our clients on what are the potential health concerns associated with some of these and help them to create products that uh, do not have these contaminants in them by removing them from uh, their synthetic products before they go to the formulation step of making a gummy or a tincture. Ah, and then, and then on to me, or was there a follow-up for Chris? On to you. On to me. So on my side, um, in the cannabis industry, people have been reinventing the wheel uh, of what organic chemists have done for a long time. I've actually forgotten if Chris's PhD was in synthetic or analytical. 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 On my side, I'm a synthetic guy. And so I would make compounds. And so therefore, when I'm looking at this on the extraction side, extraction is part of the process where you make a compound and then you start to concentrate it so that you're able to get out interferences if you're if you're looking for different compounds, qualitative or quantitative, or you're looking to optimize it for um, for the next step. And so when I'm looking at extraction, a lot of the things that have happened during the traditional extraction time where it came out of the basement and then start or garage, sometimes it was upstairs in the garage. And from there, you're having the extraction side, but then they started to do things that were traditional and then started to make them into the industry a larger. And so if you were doing you know, um, um, gaseous hydrocarbons, that would be the same thing as going to Home Depot scientific products and getting yourself some propane or something. And then the, the other part was with ethanol and so getting some Everclear or something like that. But now as you move towards the larger part, those extraction processes become more um, towards uh, industrial, hygiene and such. And so I've seen a transition over the last 10 years about moving things from, from the basement and then trying to multiply those um, larger into larger processes that will, that will be predominantly used in 2024. In two years from now, 
the processes in place won't look like the ones that were the processes in place in 2014. Um, as you're looking at the federal laws, you'll see how that's going to come into effect. And I'm sure Chris has an opinion on on the fact of the of the uh, District of Columbia Court of Appeals and saying that at no point in time can you have more than 0.3% by dry weight of THC. Well, how do you do that in a plant that you're concentrating and somehow bringing it through a concentration path extraction or separation so that it doesn't re exceed that level during the process? Mm -hmm. And so looking at those tools. So, you know, John, I want to quickly follow up with something for both you guys. And obviously, uh, you know, one hand, you know, hands off to the other, you know, you're in extraction, Chris is in testing. Um, you know, what are some of the challenges you've seen? Because we talked a little bit earlier about pediatrics and, you know, individuals that are immunocompromised. So say you have a contaminated cannabis sample that goes through an extraction process to be made into a, a cannabis oil uh, that's potentially given to a seven-month-old baby that has cancer and is on chemo and maybe even radiation. What are some of the challenges that, you know, people need to be aware of um, when looking at that? And obviously contaminated cannabis is bad, but I would imagine contaminated extracting can cannabis can be even worse. Mm -hmm. Well, Chris has seen more of the samples. I've seen more of the extraction side, but he's seen the, the products that extractors have made. So I'm assuming that with a young child like that, that there's going to be somewhere along the way that they actually have a medical doctor involved. So if you have uh, Dr. Ethan Russo along the way, there's no chance that someone's getting a contaminated product through his processes or his um, or making sure that he's gone through with Chris. I will bring not only on the contamination, but I'll bring up uh, antiometric excess. And I'll let Chris explain that because once I throw out the word, so it's multisyllabic, I'll let Chris explain it. <laughs> well, thanks for that, I think. Yeah, so contaminants are a really, uh, really critical thing, especially when you're talking about pediatrics or geriatrics. Uh, it depends on the contaminant. Uh, if the raw biomass has heavy metal contaminants in that, that oftentimes is remediated by extraction. So oftentimes hydrocarbons, ethanol, or CO2 will pull out the cannabinoids but leave the heavy metals behind. So that's less of a concern. On the other hand, if the contaminant might be a pesticide or a mycotoxin, similar to the behavior of the cannabinoids, you are going to be concentrating those. So mm -hmm. if you had 1,000 ppm in raw plant material, you most likely have 5,000 or 6,000 in an extract. Um, <laughs> and children, obviously, are very sensitive to both heavy metals and pesticides. But as I said, I'm less concerned about the heavy metals because those are, for the most part, not extracted. But these pesticides are a very serious, serious issue. When we look at black market products that come through our laboratories, I would estimate that about 98% of them are horribly, grossly contaminated with pesticides. Um, and that's of huge concern. Wow. So in the same breath, Chris, um, you know, especially talking about pediatrics and geriatrics, how important do you find potency testing and for that to be accurate, um, you know, especially if you're treating, like I said, an eight-month-old, um, you don't want to give them something that might be labeled as 10% THC, but actually is closer to 25 or 30% THC. So can you speak to that a little bit and also the need for standardization, which I feel like I've been screaming from the rooftop since we started this whole, uh, you know, outfit back in, in 2016? Yeah, dosing is very, very difficult. Every individual is different, especially with children. Um, sometimes lower dosing is actually much more efficacious than a high dose. Um, and there's a very... Uh, specific response curve to dosing. And so for parents to understand when you're talking specifically about pediatrics, it's very, uh, it takes a long time. Sometimes it takes years to dial in the appropriate dose. But once you have done that work and you've dialed in the dose, if all of a sudden you get a product which is mislabeled, um, that can be horrible for the child. I've seen cases where they've ended up in the emergency room because either they had too much or too little. They, they have a specific amount, which especially in relation to seizures, you know, it keeps them fairly well under control. And if they have a low dose because it was mislabeled, um, they can have seizures. We've also seen cases where uh, product has been labeled as an ethanol extract, but had high concentrations of isopropanol. Mm -hmm. um, there's been a couple of cases where this has actually sent children to the ER because they got, it was too high and they actually had a reaction to it. So just imagine the body weight and how sensitive they are, you know, especially with the pediatrics to these contaminants. 
Can I ask you a question about the mold to gold phenomenon of, of extracting moldy cannabis into um, you know, whatever concentrate they're doing. There's a lot of folks who believe that they're getting rid of all of these, the, the mold in there. Uh, Chris, can, can you, have you tested concentrate for that fact to see if there's zero mold afterwards? And then uh, Dr. McKay, maybe you can add your two cents on whether or not you think it's okay to, um, to use, you know, um, I was gonna say nasty bud, but moldy contaminated product, Chris. Yeah, so it'll depend on the level of contamination and exactly what species of mold it is. But in general, what we see, uh, and I'm not a microbiologist, let me preface it by that, but what we typically see is that uh, most microbial contaminants do not make it through the process, whether it's that bacterial or fungal, uh, if it's an ethanol hydrocarbon or CO2 extract, most of us uh, don't make it through that process. We have seen a little bit of instance where mold spores can make it through some of these processes, but most extraction equipment have a filter or frit uh, that's on the output of the instrument and that those are capturing most of the mold spores that would potentially make it through the extraction. And so it's very, very rare that we see a microbial contaminated extract unless it was contaminated post-extraction by human hygiene. People, uh, sounds gross, but people picking their nose while they're working with product, it does happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Dr. McKay, is it good enough to sell? It has to go through the secondary testing. So the same thing when I'm, I, I, I hear the word remediation and remediation is an adjective. It doesn't describe something. You're, you're, sometimes you're concentrating for something that's a trace product and sometimes you're remediating trying to get rid of it. So no matter what process you have, you have to go back through and then do the secondary testing. Did I, did I get rid of what I wanted to get rid of? And so on my side, I like to use, you know, hand objects and such like that. But when you're, when you're looking at one of these things, there it is. You know what this is? The 10 color pen. <laughs> that takes me back to high school. You're giving me anxiety. <laughs> I know. The teachers but have within that. that, I can choose which color I want. But when you're doing a separation technology, they will come out the same. And so... Chris has the technology to be able to, you know, separate the pink from the other pink. And the other one that Chris was talking about, as far as when you go back through and are doing remediation or you're trying to do, you know, making other products from hemp, it's kind of like, um, what would a unicorn do? I mean, you just kind of click on it and every time it comes up with a different answer. And so the process on both of these is what I use to show people what they can't see. No one believes in molecules. No one believes that there's, you know, 10, six times 0 0.0, six times 10 to the minus 23rd molecules. So when you're saying, did you get rid of all the mold? Did you get rid of the spores? You have to remember that there's a significant number of these little guys, and maybe some of them got through the process. Was it high enough through the process to get it? So when we're looking at um, um, different um, aflatoxins, um, when you do the aflatoxins, it, that little guy may have already made chemicals, that are organic chemicals, and those aren't stopping. They're organic chemicals. Now, the, the, what made it isn't, isn't there anymore. You stop that, but wherever you stop the process, and Chris has done some work on that that he can talk about more specifically. That way, I just put you on the, on the queue all the time. <laughs> yeah, my, mycotoxins are, are challenging in that uh, their occurrence is very low, but their toxicity is very high, so it's very important to be testing for those. Um, but they are... It's, a lot of people wrap them in with the microbial testing, but they are more chemically structurally similar to a pesticide than they are to a microbe. They're not a living organism. Um, I often refer to them as mold poop. Uh, it's, it's the <laughs> secondary byproduct of certain mold species. But like pesticides, if they are in a product that is being extracted, the microbe that actually created it may be killed but their poop is going to be concentrated and is highly toxic. And so that is something that um, in the state of Massachusetts, where we operate primarily, uh, mycotoxins is one of the tests required for every final product going into consumer hands. Have you done any work with shelf life stability for products that have gone through this process? Like, if, like you're saying, those things are still there. Can they continue growing on the shelf? They can, it, it depends a lot on the matrix. So most microbes, the majority of them probably want some kind of water in their environment. And so hydrocarbon extracts 
Um, by the purging process, they have very low water content. And so it's typically not an issue. Oftentimes you'll see CBD and THC in an oil base, like an MCT oil base. And, and those are not gonna have the moisture content that the microbes need to survive in general. There are anaerobic microbes which can thrive, but the, for the most part, what we see is the aerobic microbe and the shelf life for most of those products is uh, fairly long. They're fairly stable. Uh, one caveat is the new emergence of the, the beverage industry. So the CBD THC beverages, uh, because of those emulsions that are used to make the CBD or THC happy in a water environment, uh, they do have stability issues. And so we do a lot of stability shelf life testing on those types of products. Yeah, you just kind of made me think of something else with that answer. There's so many different products out there. Uh, feels like there's something new every week. Can you guys both talk about, you know, the challenges with that on the testing and both on the extraction? Huh. So on the testing side, that's why anyone who ever asked me, gee, I, I'd like to start a lab. And I say, 1-800-CALL-CHRIS-SUDELLA <laughs> and uh, see how you feel in a couple hours. Because... <laughs> Because it's not, the, it's not the, the challenge of having the equipment do the gradient or having it, you know, uh, the uh, limits of detection, limits of quantitation, limits of, of blank. The whole problem is how do, you, how, do you, how do you get that substance out of a, out of a gummy? And, and, and in some places they say, oh, it's just another gummy. And Chris can speak to the fact of one gummy is not like another gummy, and it'd be best if you know most people worked with him on the formulation side before they just threw a gummy over the into an envelope and sent it to Chris and say, "Tell me what's in it." Yeah, unfortunately, we oftentimes get very little information up front. Uh, a very good example, as John was saying, is gummies. Uh, a gelatin gummy and a vegan gummy might behave different in our extraction process. The instrument process for actually making the measurement is pretty much the same for all of our cannabinoid uh, potency testing, but how we get the sample introduced to that is very different. And so how we prepare a chocolate is very different than how we prepare a chocolate, uh, a gummy, which is also <laughs> very different from how we prepare a nano emulsion. Now, one of the challenges recently, we started seeing gummies made with a nano emulsion. So now I'm in a kind of a quandary. Do I prepare the sample as a gummy? Because it is. Or do I prepare it as a nano emulsion based product? Which it is. And sometimes we have to do both and do a little bit of R&D and method development for these samples. Um, and oftentimes what happens is we report numbers that are lower than the target formulation. And it's only then that the producers come back and say, well, I put this nano emulsion in there and it's a, a vegan gummy. And I also added in uh, capsaicin or something like that. So all these things would be very helpful for us to know up front before we start our uh, testing process. Is that information, quote unquote, open source? I mean, it, there are a lot of regulations. There's a ton of compliance, but I'm curious if there's any benefit to improving communication between testing labs and extraction labs, uh, or is the communication already open? The telephone still works. I think Chris, I, anytime I've called Chris, he's he's answered it. Industry-wide, uh, though, that works. Dr. McKay, is there, is there something industry-wide that would be a benefit if there were open communications to learn from what's happening? Is that already there, or would it be helpful? Any benefit to that? So there's some people that believe that they've, they've invented something very, very specific to themselves, and it's probably been in the literature. And so yeah. there's a lot of people thinking that they have IP, um, and, and it's not. And so the ones that are most successful have a relationship with Chris, or they have a relationship with Jeff Raber, or they have a re relationship with SC Labs. They have a relationship with someone that they're starting way from the beginning so that when things come in, they have something that's, that's being, they're looking for the measurement that they need. And it's always coming down to the, the subtleties of what that laboratory can do. Chris has some great people in there that have, have you know, decades of experience in, 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 in extraction of all kinds of stuff. But now you move towards a nano emulsion inside a gelatin that's been, I don't you know, gone through other things. But I, I, on, on, on Chris's side, how many, how many good relationships do you have versus a, here's something, uh, here's a pocket sample? Yeah, communication could always be better. Um, we certainly try to encourage producers when they are coming out with a new SKU or a new product line to get us involved early. 
I think it's oftentimes just a, a function of everybody's overworked and everybody's swamped and they're under very tight time constraints. And I think sometimes they just forget to include the lab in those conversations is what I think. Because we've had the discussions, they all agree that getting the lab involved sooner is better. It helps us it identify problems in their formulation. Uh, it helps us understand how to test it and we kind of go through them in the process. But if we're not brought in early on, we just have a lot of catch up makeup time to do to try and understand these products. And unfortunately what happens is it's not all the time, but it has happened multiple times in the past where our testing after the fact has revealed a problem in their formulation. They, they have a high variability because they're not, because of the method they've chosen, they have a very high variability of their cannabinoid potency per unit piece. And that doesn't work in a production environment where you have to uh, have very tight tolerances for your potency. So having the lab involved earlier in the process, um, we've been able to make some recommendations on changes to process and they're simple changes but it permits them to make a more reproducible product. So if you have something in, in a style, I every single morning, this works out the best. The first time it didn't, but I put my socks on, then I put my shoes on. <laughs> it's good. And it, and it <laughs> works um, so far. I've, I'm not going to say it's going to work tomorrow, but as you're looking through that process, that's the, you know, being able to go through. And, and, and Chris does have examples where, um, they've used products that match the regulations for sugar, but it mm -hmm. doesn't match the regulations for sugar in the cannabis industry because those are very different. So now they've used some product that has acceptable amount of pesticides, but not when it moves into the cannabis industry. So now they have a major ingredient and now they're full of pesticides. Is that true, Chris? Yeah, well, a perfect example of that is tinctures where um, they go through all this work to verify that their cannabis-based product has no pesticides. They verify that. Then they go right into formulation and they started adding in orange flavoring. Well, orange flavoring that's, that this particular customer was using was heavily contaminated with a pesticide that is common in citrus cultivation. And so they didn't even consider that. And they moved forward and they had a huge production batch that has now been contaminated because they used um, a... Uh, orange flavoring that had a small amount of contamination from a mazalil. Uh, it might have been okay for the food industry, but the tolerances in cannabis are oftentimes very stringent, and uh, they had a huge production batch failure because of it. And it's difficult to remediate it once it's at that final step. Well, I think we've seen a similar conversation with, like you said, putting the quality and care into the products and making sure they're contaminant free. But then we put that into a 10 cent, you know, vape pen device from overseas that can then emit heavy metals. So it's kind of like, you know, you're going kind of around the mulberry bush, if you will, in a lot of these ways. Yeah, right around it, through it. I think you go right through it. <laughs> we, we've mentioned a lot of regulations. There's a ton of compliance. What are labs and extraction facilities doing to stay ahead of new technology and compliance? It, my, the places I go are very much looking at whether they're doing ISO for their processes, because there's different processes. A lot of them are also getting certified as food. So they're going through even heavier regulation of saying, okay, I'm, I'm going to be totally regulated. I'm going to have all my food certificates all up on the wall. So when the world comes around to reality, then they're ahead of the game and other people have to get to those certifications. That's what I. That's what I'm seeing. They're also uh, taking finally the the um, putting equipment into their facilities so that they can test right there, and then hiring, you know, um, analytical chemists to be able to work there rather than doing that up front. So Chris also works with how do I have people, you know, so that they understand how to use their equipment, so that they're not sending me every single their sample. Send me your important samples, and we work together. Is that right, Chris? Yeah, I always say that the labs will be kind of a third, final uh, compliance step. But most production facilities should have in-house testing. We do a lot of consulting and help people set up that, so they they should know the answer before they send it to us, just to optimize their processes. 
Awesome. Well, I think with that, we're going to have to roll this one up. So I want to thank all of my guests, Dr. John McKay, co-founder of Dr. John McKay Institute of Extraction Technology, as well as Chris Hudola, uh, founder and CSO of Proverde Laboratories. Also want to thank Meg LaRue and Josh Krosny of MJH Life Sciences. Appreciate all of you guys being on the panel today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Take care. Thanks a lot. Have a great weekend. We're going to be back with another segment, so don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. With that, we're going to roll this one up. I'm Josh Kincaid. This is The Talking Hedge. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, or don't, and I'm out. Don't forget to smash that like button on your way out and check out these other videos that we've got.